Morning everyone, I'm Soph. I don't have any notes because I've still not unpacked my house after moving, but I've got a jazzy jumper on, so hopefully that makes up for it. And oh. Oh, sorry. No, social jet lag is not watching this with the lads. It's actually something caused by the difference between our biological, our internal clocks, and the schedules that are put upon us by society. So for example, for many of us, when we get up for work, we're waking up far earlier than our biological clocks would wake us up naturally. Now, obviously people who do shift work face this in the extreme, right? Working through their biological night, as do people who have actual travel-induced jet lag, the severity depending on how far they've gone. But in this video, I wanted to look at the subtle social jet lag because this gap between our internal time zone and the external one that we live in is an issue that many of us deal with. It's estimated that around 70% of people in Central Europe have at least one hour of social jet lag, i.e. their work schedule means they're one hour out of sync with their biological clocks. But many of us have two hours or more. Night owls who prefer to wake up later and go to bed later are especially affected. And evidence suggests that chronic social jet lag can have various effects on your health. So I'm gonna go into the science of what causes social jet lag, what some potential health impacts are, and then then talk a little bit about some potential solutions. Sounds like there's a lot of potential. <laughs> There'll be chapters chaps, so here we go. Cycle life, cycle life, cycle life. So many things in our bodies work on a daily cycle, not just a cycle of feeling awake in the morning and sleepy at night, but also things like alertness, body temperature, hunger, hormones, your immune system's activity. Evolutionarily, these biological cycles meant we could anticipate daily recurring changes, like light and dark, or food availability, or predator activity. These body cycles fall into roughly 24-hour rhythms, known as circadian rhythms. Circadian from the Greek circa diem, which means around a day. I did not know that before studying for this video, before researching this video. DM you can recognise from Carpe Diem, sees the day, and Circa from, you know, Circa. It's like a round, isn't it? Now virtually all of your cells have rhythms controlled by clock genes. Genes like the circadian locomotor output cycles kaput gene, literally the clock gene, discovered by Banter King, clearly Joseph Takahashi and his colleagues. There's also the period gene and the cryptochrome, aka cry genes, the proteins of which interact to make the period cry complex. I feel that. Anyway, um, you can think of your cells and therefore your tissues and organs as being these peripheral clocks controlled by those genes, keeping the different parts of your body ticking. These peripheral clocks need to be controlled and kept in time by a master central clock, and this is the part of your brain called the SCN, or the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I would do the lean forward, but the camera... I've got a desk between... <laughs> Science brain clock, super charismatic nucleus. And I always want to either sing it as super califragilistic or I read it as super charismatic nucleus, like, I don't know, like Aubrey Plaza is in my brain, which she is. <laughs> but in order to beat to the earth's 24 hour day night drum and to be able to tell the rest of your body too, your SCN needs external guidance. This comes in the form of ah, light. Light is the most robust and predictable environmental cue and makes a great Zeitgeber, which is a word that's often used in circadian science and it's the German for time giver. So how does light keep your SCN in time? Well, right, in school, here's a story that relates to this, I was taught there are two types of receptors in your eyes, black and white seeing rods for seeing in dim light and colour seeing cones for bright light. Already a oversimplification, but anyway. Then I went to uni and they were like, no, 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 there's a third eye receptor that doesn't really matter sight-wise, but it's important for keeping your body cycles in check. These receptors are called retinal ganglion cells, or intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells for long. This presence of this third receptor blew my mind at the time because I was 20 and I thought, I knew there was to know about biology, and yet all along there'd been something hiding in my eye that I didn't know about at all. And I feel like it feels different to learning you've been lied to in like chemistry or physics, because those feel like more complex things. But when you think you've got your own biology sussed, and then you don't, anyway, that's a bit of a ramble, but I thought it was just worth saying that the basic biology you learn in school is often just that, basic. It's often a lot more complicated than it seems. Anyway, I digress. Your third eye receptor, these retinal ganglion cells, are the ones that process light and send it to your SCN for keeping to rhythm purposes. Morning light triggers strong activation, evening light has less effect. Now, again, I just wanna be a physics nerd for a brief second because this is quite interesting. Different lights having different impacts is down to their wavelengths. So think of a rainbow, not the flag that I pledge allegiance to every morning. My but the pot of gold 
rainbow. It's made of a spectrum of seven colours, right? Red to violet. And it's over here. Before anyone comes for me on this, I know that a spectrum will have many different colours in it, right? Because obviously it has all the shades as it moves through the different main colours of the spectrum. So more than seven technically, but this is my GCSE teaching brain speaking. So thank you for your kindness. The light at the violet end has shorter wavelengths than the light at the red end. And it's the shorter wavelength blue light that you've probably heard of that has a stronger effect on these eye retinal ganglion cells. So fresh morning light is more blue, as is the light from your phone. That sends a stronger message to your SCN. Whereas long wavelength light from the red end triggers your retinal ganglion cells less. And think about how evening light is indeed more on this side of the spectrum. Think of golden hour, not the Casey Musgrave song, although think of that too, but more like in Provence. The light is far more yellowy, it's at that longer wavelength end of the spectrum. Just thought that was an interesting detour. Anyway, this setting of your master clock, the SCN, through light is called photo entrainment, literally training with light. Your SCN then controls your peripheral clocks, aka your cells, via those clock genes I mentioned earlier. And those genes and their feedback loops are in, in themselves very interesting, but I won't go into them in this video, it's long enough. <laughs> Now it's worth noting that whilst light is the boss of the zeitgeibers with your SCN, your other peripheral clocks can be impacted by other non-light geibers. These are things like stress, physical exercise and food intake. In my script I've actually written foot intake. Whatever floats your zeitgeiber. But that's the basics. I probably did that in too much detail, but I find it really interesting on how our bodies know where we're at in Earth's daily light cycle. Light trains the SCN that tells the rest of your body, and that's that. So now we have our body's clock working approximately to the beat of the Earth's light dark clock. Two clocks together, mostly in harmony. However, our society has thrown a third spanner shaped clock in the works the social clock. This one is set by work hours and social expectation and it makes things complicated. I think sometimes it being called a social clock but often the things that impact it are work related things can be a bit confusing but think of it as like social as in a society clock. Our social clocks and the earth's clock don't always match up. We sometimes have to get up before the sun's risen and sometimes we have to go to sleep after the sun sets. In addition, social clocks and biological clocks often don't match up too. And this mismatch is worse for some people because different people have different biological clocks. And as social jet lag is measured by this difference between your biological and social clocks, the more mismatched they are, the worse your social jet lag will be. Before I go more into this, I just wanted to clear something up. I just wanted to clear the air, guys. Whilst researching this video, I found there's another way that social jet lag is described as the difference between your schedules on your working days versus non-working days. So if you go from waking up at 7 a.m. on a working day to 9 a.m. on a free day, that shift causes your jet lag. And switching between those two every weekend is the equivalent of flying two time zones. So flying from London to Nairobi and then back again when the weekend's over, which is quite a nice way to contextualize what a strain that could end up being on your body. Although obviously without the strain of flying. <laughs> but of course, this difference is caused by your social and biological clocks. On free days, we're more likely to live according to our natural internal clocks. And so the weekend weekday discrepancy becomes a mirror of the biological social discrepancy. Of course, it's often more complicated than this. Our days off aren't always representative of our biological clocks either. If we've not been sleeping enough when working, we'll oversleep to catch up with what's called sleep debt. That's something we have to pay to sleep Tom Nook if we've not been catching enough Zs. Or we may use our day off freedom to ignore our biological clock's desire for sleep and stay up late instead. And if you have a sesh, alcohol leads to poor sleep quality too. So many of us aren't necessarily falling into our natural biological rhythm on free days, meaning that our weekday weekend time difference may not match directly with our biological social time difference, if that makes sense. I feel like I just wanted to clarify that because I got confused about the two as two different concepts of social jet lag. But the thing is, the more your work schedule goes against your biological rhythm, so the more different these two are, the harder it will be to fall into that biological rhythm on your days off, slash the harder it will be to go back to working after having a few days living your best biological rhythm life. Which brings me back to the point I had before, Different people have slightly different circadian rhythms, and that means that some people feel social jet lag worse than others. Now you might be thinking, well, how do people have different circadian rhythms if circadian rhythms are set by the sun? Surely everyone's would just be the same. And I would say, that's a good thought, well done. But this is where chronotypes come in. 
science word that feels a bit Avengery, chronotype. Even in a world without any other obligations or no artificial light, where we were living our purest sun-driven clock lives, there would still be variation in when we naturally get up and go to sleep. All our clocks run on approximately 24 hour cycles, but not quite. And some run a bit faster, some run a bit slower. This is partly determined by your genes, with a G. If you have a faster rhythm, it means you're ready for bed earlier. And so you're what's sometimes called a lark or an early riser or a nerd. If your rhythm is slower, it takes you a bit longer to be ready to sleep. And so you're an owl or a night owl. Larks have short clocks, owls have long clocks. Clocks. <laughs> Different preferences for short or long clocks. <laughs> Different preferences means we can be sorted into chronotypes. Chronotypes are, like many things in nature, a spectrum, a normal distribution like this. Most people are between the two extremes, but some people will be really early risers and some people will be dead of the night night owls. And evolutionarily, this is great. You want people to have peak alertness at different times so you can spread the community's workload across the day. Now, I also said just then that chronotype is controlled partly by genes because they can also be influenced by our environment. External cues like artificial light can push a night owl's night owlness even further. And it can obviously affect larks too. Our preferable sleep patterns also change when we age. So for example, teenagers physiologically need more sleep than adults. And so that's reflected in their preference for sleeping in. Even geographical location impacts your chronotype. So this is how it works, right? If you're on the Western side of a time zone, the sun will rise later for you than on the Eastern side so you'll want to get up a bit later. And it's been found that waking times shift by four minutes for every degree of longitude within a time zone, which I think is really interesting. All of this to say, the more of a night owl you are, for whatever reason you're a night owl, the more you'll feel social jet lag. Why? Because we live in a lark city, not an owl city. Owls will find it harder to wake up for early work alarms, find it harder to go to sleep at an appropriate time at night, and will be more likely to have radically different weekend and weekday schedules, leading to chopping and changing messages for the body. Thanks to most working patterns being built for early risers, owls end up dealing with irregular cycles and lots of sleep debt. And that means, unfortunately, they're more likely to have to deal with the negative impacts of social jet lag. So what are these effects of social jet lag? Well, in this review in 2021, that I've also linked below, all the research on social jet lag was brought together. An obvious effect is sleep deprivation. You're getting less or lower quality of sleep. You also might be sleepier the next day, but it also may take you longer to fall asleep. Your mood may be worse and it may be harder for you to concentrate on tasks. A study of over 4,000 people also found that those with two or more hours of social jet lag showed higher likelihood of depression symptoms. There are other biological impacts too. For example, increased levels of cortisol, the hormone associated with stress, as well as a higher resting heart rate and higher cholesterol and levels of these fats called triglycerides, both of which are risk factors for heart disease and stroke. It's worth adding in here that these are people who like regularly have a two hour sleep jet lag, like that's almost part of their normal schedule at this point. And that it's when these issues become chronic, become repeated over a long period of time, that they will most likely end up posing more of a long term potential issue. Now, these increased levels of cholesterol and triglycerides could be partly because of the unhealthy behaviours that arise because of social jet lag. You're more likely to eat high calorie and high sugar foods. There are other associated issues with social jet lag but they had kind of less evidence and sometimes contradicting results so I won't go into them here and the methods that are used to study social jet lag in general could be improved in some places so it's kind of a developing area of research but it does make sense that having a disrupted sleep pattern will have knock-on effects on different aspects of your life because your circadian rhythms have roles to play throughout your body as I've discussed and even if there's only a little bit of a health risk with social jet lag it's so prevalent that it could well be adding up and having a big impact on public health as a whole so how can we improve improve things. Well, ideally, it would happen at a government level. Like we'd be able to have flexible schedules that match with our chronotypes. My old lecturer at uni, who's this amazing circadian scientist called Russell Foster, and I actually asked for his autograph after his first lecture with us at the age of 21. What a nerd. But anyway, my old lecturer, Russell Foster, he hated 
alarm clocks. And I've seen a lot of scientists agree with this. In an ideal world, rather than having censure prematurely yank us out of our snooze, we'd sleep until we woke up naturally, then go about our day. And to put it in terms that economists would like, this would lead to better productivity. But despite changes like these being beneficial, uptake seems a little while away. A one-size-fits-all workplace culture isn't working for us really, but it also isn't changing particularly quickly. It's the same problem I discussed in my period video, where I said that productivity would be boosted if people people with regular menstrual cycles could work according to their monthly rhythms. But like I say, there is some stuff on like four day working weeks and some stuff on flexible working coming through, partly thanks to the remote working boom from working from home, but I, I won't go into that now. It's not picking up speed as much as could potentially be useful. So making your life as a night owl easier is for the time being in your own hands. Well, wings. So the next step is to try and have as much control over your schedule as you can and make it work for you within your limits. Now this isn't possible for everyone, but maybe you can start work a bit later and leave a bit later, or you can get your partner to take the kids to school in the morning and then you take on evening duties, or you can take more evening or night shifts and leave the morning shifts to the larks. All of these are things that could potentially help you out a bit, but a lot of people won't have that kind of flexibility. So then we move on to another potential option, trying to shift your circadian cycle a bit. Now this is possible to some extent in most of us. Studies where people camped out living by the light of the sun rather than artificial light saw their cycles shift to be more in tune with day and night. So shifting is possible and if you're a night owl, if you can shift your cycle enough so that you can have a regular schedule that you can follow both at weekends and weekdays, this can be really beneficial for you. Lots of scientists argue that keeping to a rhythm is the most important route to circadian health as long as it's a somewhat healthy schedule. I'm not saying a rhythm of like one hour sleep is good. <laughs> Regularity allows your body to get into a groove rather than giving it whiplash when you change schedules twice a week. So something that can help you get into the groove is getting up at the same time or at least the same time within an hour and going to bed at a similar time every day of the week, whether it's a working day or a non-working day. Even eating at a similar time each day can have an impact. This one is often taken for granted, but because eating can be a zeitgeber for your peripheral clocks, the timing of it can also have an impact on your rhythms. Give your body more cues that morning is morning. Try to have sunlight or at least light shining on you for 15 minutes not long after you've woken up. Do some exercise, just a walk or something, not long after waking up. Eat not long after you've woken up. These are all cues to tell your body that it's time to power up. And similarly, give your body cues that evening is evening. Avoid eating too late, avoid exercising too late, avoid light too late, etc. Doing these things to the beat of a regular rhythm can help shift your clock a little bit to help you suffer from jet lag a bit less. Again, I know it's annoying if you're a night owl because current society isn't made for you. So feeling like you have to change your rhythms can be a pain. And as I said, chronotypes are on a spectrum. So some people will be real night night owls and I don't know how much this would help you. So this won't work for everyone, but hopefully the advice might help some people out. And that's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Please do like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe it if you subscribe it, media my socials if you want to do that, and comment with whether you're Team Edward or Team Jacob, Team Lark or Team Owl. <laughs> but I mean, let me know your Twilight preferences. Otherwise, all that's left to say is thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day, and remember, ooh, I forgot to do a remember, don't forget to do a remember next time. <laughs> Muchas gracias, patrons. Thank you so much for your support with a special new hello, welcome do, 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 to Autumn Goodwin. And a hello again, as always, do, 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 to Poozlius and Drove. I felt like you deserved a fanfare also. But yeah, thanks to all my patrons. You're great. Look at my jumper. I'm so happy with it. Got it for my birthday. 28 jumper time. 28 jumper time. It's a fine time to have a jumper time when you're 28 and you're constantly online. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Oh, I should have Thomas not be like, sing, you know, that like, king thing. I'm only joking. <laughs> I moved flat recently. I've got things still in boxes. I moved flat recently. In Bristol, there are foxes in my garden, pooping in my garden. I don't mind them because I love the wildlife. I moved, I moved flat really quite recently. I moved, I moved flat. Maybe you will see me if you're in my new city. Then you'll see me in the city. It will be very pretty when you see me in the city. I'll sing you a ditty if you see me in my city. My new city, my new home.
I should not be the kind of person who's allowed a microphone. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'd fallen asleep. It's the end screen. <laughs> oh, here's a few videos, here's one video, and here's a patron link. Bye-bye.